Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Now today I'm happy to reintroduce to you um, Max McCown. Max has been here before to discuss, many times actually, but I was actually in the room when he, we discussed uh, why the world hates Microsoft. Then later, in 2004, um, we explored the topic of why indifference is death. Today, um, as you can see, um, we're going to be discussing humanity, culture, and the X-ray paradox. But as those of any of you ever heard Max speak before? you realize um, that we'll be talking about a whole bunch of stuff within that, uh, within that topic. Um, Max is a strategic advisor to many major companies and a well-known speaker on subjects of innovation, engagement, customer experience, and competitive advantage. He's the author of six books, including Why They Don't Buy, The Science of Selling Online, The E-Customer, and Unshrink, which is about the myths that stop people from doing their best work. So please join me in welcoming Max McCown. Since we're a very small audience, uh, I'm going to bring you to the front. I know that that's most un-Microsoft. You, you wouldn't want to move. But, uh, but come anyway. Come anyway. It, it will demonstrate something, <laughs> which I can talk about as we go along. Um, hello, world, uh, if you're listening. Yeah, to try the first two rows, if you dare. <laughs> we can view that as the back row. Oh, look, you're still staying, aren't you? Uh, you sure? No, it's not rebels. You, you're just not sure. No, come. <laughs> come. No. Well, we could pursue it. Um, it's interesting always to judge how much discomfort somebody has to go through before, they'll, before they will move, which is almost as interesting as the topic that we're, we're discussing itself. So, so what would it have to take? Would I have to wander over and sort of... Uh, run my hands through your hair. <laughs> uh, and, the, and you do it? And you do it? If you do it, I, I'll... Uh, okay, well, you stay there if you're, you're happy. I, it's not all about uh, forcing people to do stuff. Um, I know that, there's, um, that there are people watching at home uh, or wherever they, they are on their snow days, extended breaks. Um, we're going to go through some stuff that's a work in progress uh, in that... I'm looking into complex causality, how stuff really happens, uh, and also into total organizations. So total strategy, totalitarian states, a, a range of how do you make people do stuff that they don't want to. Um, because I'm a, a, an activist, I'd like things to get better. So the reason I want to understand that clearly is to stop, uh, is to figure out how you stop people making us do things that we don't want to do. Yeah. Uh, why that's a business, it, sometimes that bothers business audiences, um, but not to, that I view you as particularly a business audience, uh, because they don't see where the bottom line is. Um, there is a bottom line, although it, it scarcely seems worth mentioning. I mean, to, to stop organizations doing bad stuff seems enough. Uh, but uh, there is so, something, we, we can go through it, which suggests that also people do their worst work in those kind of total organizations. They run out. They run out of steam. There's certainly not any kind of perpetual machine, an organization that is total. Uh, it's anathema, really. It's a, a closed system that eventually just dies. Uh, so that's some good reasons for, for understanding it. And people uh, mess lots with organizational design. Um, sometimes, just as uh, if you've ever done IT support of any kind, you can't believe the kind of people they allow to use you know, computers. You wish that they'd keep them locked up uh, only for smart people. Um, certainly, organizational design ha has a, a number of, um, I, it, well, amateurs is okay, but uh, sort of uh, overconfident amateurs uh, who mess with what they don't understand, and so they redesign as though somehow we would comply, and worse, uh, th they think that the objective will be reached by the redesign. Now, we may comply, and the objective will not be reached. Most of us know that we don't always comply, and that's how we reach our objective. So you've got all these sort of uh, forces going together. So, so I'll go through some things. I'm not guaranteeing that I finish this deck of slides, but we'll explore some ideas. That, that's the main focus. So the future. Um, if you believe uh, absolutely in fate that everything's determined, there's almost no point listening. 
to, to this kind of thing. And there's certainly no point to trying to change anything in the world because it's fixed. Uh, the, the, no point at all. I mean, there was the Protestant idea that uh, you should work to get rich because if you got rich, that was determined, and that meant that you'd be saved in the hereafter. Now, of course, you could do it for that reason, but that, that's um, clearly a contradiction. Um, I believe the future is malleable. I mean, it has causes, right? It, can you ever be sure on any particular day whether what you're doing is because of your choice or because of your parents' choices or because of something you saw or because of your biology? Are you sure? I mean, if you start worrying about this stuff too much, of course, you get very depressed and don't do anything. And then you don't know whether that's because of how you were brought up. <laughs> um, you know, the, impossible. So I would assume that the, not everything is possible in the future because it has total causes. It's going somewhere, but it's malleable. Our choices make a difference to what happens. And so listening to this will change something, uh, presumably. So the future is malleable, and it's a, a cool idea. So we can shape it if we understand it uh, and those forces. Uh, the future and reality is also both complicated, something I've touched on before, and complex. Complicated is much easier. Uh, complicated is something that you can just split up into bits. Complicated is how you uh, prepare a project. You cut it up into bits. That's how you're taught, anyway. You put it into MS Project. And then, of course, everything happens the way that uh, you have planned. So, so that's very easy. Um, but unfortunately, most things are complex. They're woven together. Uh, you can't separate them and then put them back together. They're woven together, uh, hence the, the idea of unintended consequences. If you touch one thing, you don't know what else will happen. Now, I'm not saying that if you kill a butterfly today, then that will make your aunt or mother die. Um, it's not that kind of a worry. I'll touch nothing because something bad could happen. But you certainly have to, I think, accept that the world is complex in order to try to change it. People looking into complexity theory, incidentally, and the, the whole area of uh, emergence theory, there's a great journal just called Eco um, in Emergence Theory, have been looking into complexity for so long that they now, that they wrote an editorial um, a year ago saying, we ache for simplicity. Uh, we discovered, we decided the world was more complex than thought, but if only somebody would simplify it again. And uh, we'll come on to that point too. Because if you accept that the world is a complex place, how do you manage it? I mean, you move without having to think through every molecule and atom and uh, the, your central nervous system and everything else. And you know that if you think about walking, as I used to do, if, um, if I saw some girls walking when I was in high school, I'd suddenly think about how I was walking. Was I walking right? And then I'd trip. I mean, it would be an automatic thing. If you think about the unconscious, you, you then trip up. So dealing with the complexity is diff difficult, but you have to admit it and then get on. OK, I'll show you this video and then talk. It's about culture. Okay, so uh, only to say, that obviously you don't like soccer, um, but uh, do you like soccer? No? <laughs> um, so, so prob anyway, so, so culture affects things. That kind of made sense, didn't it? Brazilians play football for fun, supposedly. Germans play football be because, uh, for the motherland or something. Um, so th there are different reasons, and although they're stereotypes, they still apply. Each place that you go to does something slightly different. Late. So we'll carry on with culture and the, the way this might work. Oh. Okay. Another the link to, to culture, the, I'll bring the, lots of this together, but I want to start lots of threads first, is again an, another idea that I've mentioned before, which is the way that organizations, when they start, have a fair balance between doing things and figuring them out. And ideas just get out there. That's why people join startups, because it's fun. You get ideas out there. As organizations continue, you get a situation where more and more is about just doing it, get on with it, do it the way I've always told you to do. Now, everybody knows that that's true. Yeah, everybody. And by the time somebody gets promoted all the way up, secretly they're just saying, look, if they just would do things the way I want them done, everything would be better. Meanwhile, everybody who's doing it would like a little bit of the figuring it out action. And most of all, they'd like some of the make a difference action. That's the best thing. 
the, the idea that your piece got out here, uh, it, it, whatever you do, that it got out here. And they've 300 product groups or something at Microsoft, and I often wonder how much stuff ever gets out then. Uh, I don't mean shipped, that's a whole different problem, and I wouldn't be so unkind as to kick you there. But um, I just mean out. And that's sort of disappointing. People want their stuff to, to get out. But typically, small to big, this becomes the problem in the name of efficiency. But efficiency really isn't the big problem anymore. We, we've got efficiency generally. Um, all of which sort of coalesces into this idea that we change lots of things, but we don't necessarily make progress. Yeah? By that, change management is not the same as progress management. It's amazing that we haven't figured out that progress design would be a better idea than change management. I mean, why on earth would you hire a consultancy to do a big change management piece? Why would we want things to be different for the sake of it? Now, performance management, maybe, but far better progress or advancement or something that is worth having. Uh, because otherwise, you essentially pay mat the consultants to do something that is of no value and will require a fix-up change management job at the end. Automatically, this is. Uh, let alone the fact that cons large consultancies, um, uh, their, their motivation is to continue being paid rather than solve. Right. Um, sources of innovation, then. Product in the 1960s was most of it. This is um, the, the difference between companies was, was mainly the flavor of toothpaste or the color of toothpaste. It's all in the product because they did things in exactly the same way. This is culture, exactly the same way because they'd read the same books by Chandler, the business histories. Everybody wants to do it exactly the same way. And so they, they tried. And 20% different in process. And by the 1990s, you've got even more difference in product but the difference between companies is not so much product as culture. So if you hold these th thoughts as we go. GE, who really, Jack Welsh gets famous for lots of things. But if you want to have a pop, if I wanted to have a pop at him, it would be the idea that eventually buying and selling companies on some kind of Boston matrix runs out of steam. You can't do it forever. Everybody can see you coming. But he did it for a fair amount of time. It appears some little accounting things are coming out bit by bit. Um, but, but just dribbling out because he's a smart guy and everybody covers him, so it's so terrific. But really the G quality myth is sometimes just that. Any Six Sigma people in the room? Excellent. I'm proud of it. <laughs> You're a black belt, aren't you? you know? No, okay, that's all right. We'll, we'll accept you. <laughs> we'll accept you, absolutely. And one, one of the things they're pushing for is their own innovation project, uh, innovation, uh, Imagination at Work. And they put a, a lady called Beth Comstock in charge of it, who's a good person. Um, I chatted to her, but she's a marketing person. And um, her first push at it at least appeared to be, um, I'm not being careful, I'm just being kind <laughs> in case she, <laughs> she ever watches it, but it appeared to be a push that said, okay, if we market innovation at work and we put up lots of posters all over the wall, then people will feel more creative at work and therefore create more. Unfortunately, um, well, not only does it not work, uh, although a good use of paper, um, uh, the, the, the other thing that happened was that these black belts, these quality people, these total quality people, these total institution people, they didn't like it. Because they said, no, I think we have to check out how many errors there are in your innovations. How on earth can we measure your innovation? Because it's defects per thousand innovations. And of course, innovation and creativity aren't really like that, are they? I mean, how would you know? And surely the anomaly is the innovation. I mean, you could kill the innovation and say it just doesn't fit. It's a defect. Uh, uh, and so on. So certainly what happened from the conversation was that the, the G people, quality people, were fighting the G innovation people. And they carry on fighting to this day, uh, really. But we'll see how it all turns out. So people who want things to be neat, 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 tend to not enjoy things being messy. And ten, people who enjoy things being messy, of course, don't really like efficiency either. I mean, sometimes I, I suggest that a creative person, and I'm not necessarily so somebody who likes change, progress, innovation, really doesn't do it to add to the bottom line. They do it because it's really fun. Equally, people who talk about bottom line and efficiency often seem to do it because they get off on numbers and efficiency. Um, they, they just like neat lines. That's it. It's as simple as that. It's personal preference. But they put a whole bunch of support behind their preferences, at least in my 
uh, bias opinion. Okay, so here we see, uh, that, uh, I sh should always point this out to people, that they're not always sure, uh, that's the chimp brain and that's the human brain. <laughs> yeah? that it, broadly speaking, that still, it, it, it doesn't mean that we're better than chimps, but it certainly suggests uh, and explains why there are now fewer chimps than humans because we're basically better at adapting and doing stuff than they are. And yet we all know the off-repeated <laughs> off idea that, um, we'll, we'll just uh, go here, yeah? Okay, we know the off-repeated idea that essentially 99% of our, 98.4% of our DNA supposedly is the same as the chimps. We know that kind of idea. And yet what a difference. I mean, they're not the same, are they? They can use tools, but they've certainly never developed DVDs, uh, you know, or nuclear weapons, obviously. Apart from in that, um, no, even in Planet of the Apes, they use ours, don't they? <laughs> you know, they haven't got that far. Uh, so, so there's subspecies prejudice even in the movies. Um, we'll just go back. Okay, so if our whole push and our success, uh, it, it, certainly our success at dominating other species, is because of our brain matter and our ability to communicate. I mean, a huge amount of our evolutionary effort has gone into the mouth <laughs> um, to, and being able to communicate and hear and that, then deal with that. That suggests that organizations will do better if they're able to think, hence the other slides you've already seen. Yeah? So think, this is the IBM version of it. And uh, he took it from his previous organization, so that's called Steel, uh, so, so, um, which he did, had on the other side. <laughs> Got you. Um, but uh, think, and then apples think different, uh, and then other people borrow it in the same way. The ability to think between organizations surely should equal their success. Now, obviously, also chance, luck, circumstance, all those things. I mean, was Bill, Bill apparently smart, but he was also lucky, wasn't he? It would seem so. Unless, of course, you believe in fate that's already been mentioned, in which case he was foreordained to... You don't believe that. You probably, so some of you do, of course, religiously uh, on Sundays or whenever your religious day is, but otherwise, you don't believe it. So, so it's the ability to think different on the whole that advances the human species. That seems reasonable. That seems reasonable. Now, I'm not going to go back into a whole so age of rationality, age of enlightenment speech at the moment, but it still appears that we make progress when we're thinking as opposed to when we can't. But it's a particular kind of thinking that I'll get in onto. Um, hopefully nothing will play. Okay, good. So this figure is um, the number of improvements made by Toyota in what? What do you think the measure might be? This is number of improvements implemented. What, what do you think the, the metric would be? You know? Between the 2004 and 2005 Camry. Okay. <laughs> that, that's fabulous, actually. To, you love Toyota, obviously. No, I'm just being no, no, that, that, That's good. <laughs> no, that's uh, excellent. It's not the Camry as such, but it is in one factory in its first year in the U.S. Ideas submitted and ideas implemented. That's quite good. Now, if I'd started at a different point and asked you how many changes they'd made, unless somebody was just being a pain, um, you would have said, I don't know, 100, 200, 300,000? You wouldn't have got to 80,000, I don't believe. It's remarkable, 80,000. So, so what's necessary for that many people to think together? But what would be necessary? Well, you'd have to know that it, there was something worthwhile for you, maybe. But wouldn't you also have to know that your idea would be used so in year two, you're far more likely to put in a suggestion for improvement if it's been used in the first year. If it hasn't been used for three years that you've been here, banging your head against, you know, whatever you bang your head against, um, you give up if it hasn't been used. The quickest way to, to reduce this is not to use them. 80,000 improvement suggestions is remarkable, but 80,000 improvement implementations suggest that the next year you will have maybe just as many, or at least as many good ideas as the first year. They make it very easy, incidentally, to suggest. It's the opposite of the total institution it, it, in the sense that they make it very clear what you can improve. They have a, an operating manual that's huge, 
and anybody can make a suggestion to any part of it. And if you get your idea in, everybody else has got to obey you, which you get off on. I mean, imagine the kind of jokes. If it was a wiki, Toyota would be, of course, a failure, but it, it's not. Um, right. So this idea that 99, the difference between us, apparently, is now, um, it used to be, I'm just trying to remember, it used to be 0.25% difference genetically between us, and now it's 0.5%. So we've become more different in the past two weeks, um, which is remarkable. Uh, apparently, there's something called, uh, I don't know who knows the exact acronym, SVC or SVA, link that particular chains that take personality traits and move them on generation after generation. Explain some of our difference. Anyway, we're very, very similar too. And yet 1% to half percent makes all the difference between species, between individuals. Huge amount of difference. And the same with companies. All those different results in the same industries buying the same chairs and the same, I don't know, drinks, I suppose. They have free drinks at Google, free drinks here. You're buying the same stuff from the same suppliers, hiring the same stock from the same universities, and you can end up with different results. How does that happen? I think it's intriguing. Because if you only say, well, it's by hiring the best people, that doesn't seem enough. Why is it people come into an organization, get used up, and then leave? How do they hit that and leave it, and so forth? So let, let me just show you very quickly some um, ways in which this kind of uh, diversity, difference, uh, ability to think is useful in a business sense before then going back into what I think are maybe more important matters, uh, the, the differences between large cultures. It seems a good idea to have an organization that can think because you can make other competition irrelevant. This is the blue ocean idea. The only thing about the blue ocean idea that's, that's wrong, uh, perhaps, is that it misses out culture. Culture is what leads to and perpetuates and sustains difference between organizations. So this is the idea that you make up your own rules. You don't just copy the next person. Uh, the idea that you miss the place where the, the sharks play and instead you play in... Uh, Instead of the bloody area, you move to beautiful areas, and then finally to paradise, uh, giving you the, the, I should have asked my the English compadre to, to say that line, bloody beautiful paradise, uh, which is where you'd end up. The idea that by being your own person, allowing difference, you get to some place that nobody else wants, your unique spot. But by the time you've integrated and sought synergy, sometimes the difference between projects has gone. And you're not looking after a particular vertical in a really creative way. You're looking after the same group in the same way. And uh, it leads to no results. Okay, more serious fact. And again, a difference. Uh, during the Second World War, um, in the Baltic regions, the Baltic states, 90% of those who were Jewish there died. Well, they didn't just die. Obviously, they were murdered, uh, sent to, to various camps and killed 90%. But in Denmark, only 1%. Well, that seems to me a very interesting uh, cultural fact, really. Um, the Jews, are, I take it that uh, I'm Jewish, uh, vaguely. My grandfather is anyway. I only say that because I'm bound to offend somebody by even using these kind of examples. Um, but I assume that the Jews in De Denmark weren't friendlier than the Jews in the Baltic states. It wasn't a difference between the Jewishness of these people or their likability. They weren't just really irritating in the Baltic states. It was somehow that the, um, the... Well, we know what happened in Denmark and in Sweden. People got around and they said, well, you're not different, you're ours. Uh, and you know, I mean, you know basically the, the stories about the, the king of Sweden or something putting his, um, putting his star of David on him too and saying, take us all. If you want any of us, take us all. Well, I was trying to think, would that even happen in an organization like this? I don't mean the killing bit. That's a bit too scary for now. We'll move along. I mean, that's really, if you ask yourself tough questions like, you know, would I speak up for anybody anyway? Um, but just even somebody speaks up in a meeting, says something that you agree with but is greeted as stupid, would you say I agree or would you keep quiet? How about if they're forced to the door somehow because they've said something that is against the grain? Would you go with them? Risk your career, stay where you are. I mean, some guy last, week, last year did, wrote some Think Week paper that irritated his boss and was a contractor, pushed out the door. So 
well, I didn't leave. <laughs> uh, so what kind of friend am I? What, what does it take to be that sort of solid? W would you stand up for somebody or wouldn't you? Um, how total has Microsoft become? Or how conditioned are you by the time you've beat everybody in high school, beat everybody at university, got your job by beating everybody else, and then join a competitive company? So they're, they're serious questions, I think, you know, reasonable questions. And would solidarity be useful anyway in a dog-eat-dog -dog world? We'll come back to, to this particular point later. So culture, other elements of it. You've got just bullying. One definition of bullying is a trivial fault that is distorted, misrepresented, uh, and uh, added to with fabrication, attempts to undermine you, being singled out, treated differently, being ignored, patronized, overloaded, humiliated, having your responsibility increased, but your authority reduced. Uh, that must have happened to at least one person here. Um, having leave refused, apart from on snow days, being denied training, having unrealistic goals set that change when it suits those in authority. Um, uh, even worse when your good idea is denied because somebody else uh, says it doesn't fit with their commitments. Um, try again next year. Um, this kind of bullying obviously affects us, th these kind of distorted things that are done with justification because the person thinks that it's reasonable to deny you whatever it is or patronizing, that's how they've got on. Um, uh, other examples of culture and brainwashing, um, I've never used brainwash, but this uh, it, quote, you have no confidence in yourself, you're weak and uh, inadequate, comes from an experiment was that was done in Canada but funded by the CIA. Uh, somebody <laughs> must have uh, covered this, but this was a long time ago, 60s as far as I recall. Um, in the 60s what they did was they, they put people um, into the, these cells, they, they weren't prisoners, but they, they ended up with them, I think they were patients, and they put headphones on them, and they played this message 24 hours a day, looped. So th that's what they did. And as a result, people would just fall over. They couldn't walk anymore. The stand-up fall over, couldn't wash themselves. It you know, took, took uh, ages. And some, some of them are still aggressive now, apparently, um, as a result of this. And that seems, again, intriguing about the nature of behavior. If behavior can be changed by playing that, surely all you have to do is go, it's only words. No, they don't hurt you, do they? That's what the rhyme says. Only sticks and stones do that. How is it that that took away the ability to move and the kind of almost will to live? How does that work? Because if that's right, we'll, we'll go into to another idea. If it's right that somehow our experience alters our sense of self-esteem, our self-efficacy, that self-control, and also our self identity, therefore our self-concept, con uh, if somehow our experiences alter our behavior and our sense of self, I know this is a, a quick example and a, only a small amount of proof, but if it affects it that much, then if we want to change anything, we'd want to change the experiences that people have. You can't just demand that people are more innovative and treat them exactly the same as the previous day, even if our passion is to deliver all things innovative and, and help you to be so which I believe is the gospel currently um, uh, here. So if it changes that, we have to find ways of altering experience, altering what happens to us every day in order to lead to new performance. Is there anything that makes sense? So you either do it for yourself, um, and that's a very powerful thing, as in find at least one person that believes in you, um, preferably that works here, um, which would be good, because if you get home and you share this with your spouse, uh, they're not interested, even though they love you. <laughs> well... Again, you may be lucky or unlucky to, to be married to somebody who understands everything that goes on in your life. But find somebody, find some space, some belief space in order to start changing the experience that you have. Another example of culture changing people, this is um, the results of a survey, a questionnaire, that asked school children in different cities around the world that their opinions of themselves. And again, if culture has no impact on how people think, what would explain the fact that they all answer so differently? Uh, is it really the case that, um, let, let's uh, take an example, so, so Shanghai here, and uh, answer five, I am honest. Are people in Shanghai actually more honest than people in Seoul? They could be, I suppose, and what would explain that in the first place? Why is it that, that I'm sure somebody can quickly analyze this, I'll give you a moment because your numbers people. There we go. Enjoy. Um, but the, the idea that, again, different cultures result in different self-images seems borne out by this kind of data. I'm trying to give you enough to at least accept that fact. 
because if they, these various bits of evidence suggest that culture really alters everything, then culture becomes more important and certainly not something that HR should either be left to do or ignored doing. It, it all matters. The way I'm asked alters my behavior. Okay, uh, Mr. Stalin. Um, I want to go through a few behaviors, leadership behaviors, including doing a Mao, which was part of the original title, to, to suggest um, things that certainly don't help. Um, Stalin, uh, apart from being an egotist and killing, I don't know, 70 million people, let's say, um, for, for the sake of it, he believed he was infallible. And the problem with that is that as soon as you suggest that you are infallible or make it very clear that um, any disagreement with you would be tantamount to saying that you are wrong and therefore not as clever as you've previously been said to be, um, this infallibility is, is, of course, a weakness. Now, he stays in power his whole life, so you could argue it worked for Stalin. Um, but consider the example when the Second World War during the Second World War, when he told his troops and his generals that they would definitely, definitely never, ever be invaded by Germany. Never. It will not happen. I wish I had the Russian to say that to you right now in strong terms. He said, never will, will this happen. And as a result, when Germany did invade, his, troop, his generals didn't tell him about it for two days. So they've invaded, they're bombing things, nobody tells Stalin. Um, and in other organizations, who knows this one, um, the similar things have been said. So, so somebody once said that uh, Linux would never beat Microsoft. We will never lose to Linux. Uh, do you like the way I'm doing that American pronunciation for you all? Uh, lovely. So Linux, and as a result, in some regions of the world, nobody ever told headquarters that they'd been losing regularly to Linux. So imagine what that sort of pretense of infallibility cost the company. It uh, depends who you're supporting, I suppose. But any notion that you can't be wrong means nobody can tell you you're wrong. And since you're almost always going to be wrong, you know, every hour uh, at least, <laughs> uh, you need somebody who can tell it, which means that leadership behavior has to become not about just, hey, I've got an open door, but look, tell me I'm wrong, really. I'll tell you 10 things that I've done wrong this morning. Now, I know some people say that, and you just don't trust them so you wouldn't make the mistake of telling them to, to their faces, but it appears a smart leader will find some way of giving, making it clear to you that you are safe. Now, that's a fairly sophisticated task, but an important one. Uh, just saying it doesn't make it so. We know what's happened to, to people who have told the truth. Um, doing a Mao that we get onto. Um, Mao was uh, an egotist almost from birth. It, it was almost belies what I said about environment affecting behavior. Uh, it, it appears he was simply warped. Um, he, he was the kind of uh, sociopath uh, and psychopath to some extent who had no concern for anybody else. So when he was a child, uh, first uh, he used to hit his father as soon as he was sort of uh, big enough. And when he was a teenager, he used to beat his father. And then... Um, it, uh, in, when he was at high school, or the equivalent of high school, he wrote in the margins of his book things like, the world is only Mao. Apart from Mao, there is nothing. Those kind of statements. Um, you could almost imagine them coming from after a Stephen Covey course or something, the kind of things that they would say in a mission statement. Uh, very definite. And what Mao did was, because he only believed in what Mao wanted, he would never get on with doing the task. So he joined the Communist Party because he figured the Communist Party was the next big thing in China. So obviously, good trend spotter, you know, kind of cool hunter that we'd want in the company. So he understood that was going to be big, joined the Communist Party, and never bothered to learn any of the technical terms. Uh, so much so that the, uh, and this was big in communism, technical terms. And when the Soviets used to come over and uh, check Mao out, they used to laugh and tease at him, him behind his back and say, just as an idiot. He doesn't understand false consciousness or anything. Um, but he didn't care about that because he was always busy uh, maneuvering his own way to success. So he said, well, who cares about what you're doing? It's all about Mao. And when they'd send him off uh, with a set of troops to war, to, to battle with the, the rest of the, the, the Chinese army on the other side, Mao would never go to the front. He would take his troops and go off rampaging and looting um, while his comrades were being killed at the front. Now, if you were focused on the task, you'd never do that. 
you'd do, never do that. But his comrades, who were brave people, would go and fight, and then they'd come back with half of their troops killed, and he would come back from looting, and he'd mop up all the people who were st had still survived. So now he had an army that was twice as big and all the loot, and he hadn't died. And he consistently did this throughout his career. So when other people were worrying about communism and its ethics and how to help the people, he was busy figuring out how to kill people on the side in order to be promoted. And this kind of, sort of um, very, very uh, powerful, clever, skillful, uh, close political game that he played meant that he did a Mao to everybody that he met. Now, doing a Mao for you is if you're ever in a group and uh, you, somebody Mao-like is in the group, you will all agree on the priorities, and you will assume that they are following the priorities and that they're getting on with the job, only they're not. They're busy sucking up to somebody. Yeah? That's doing a Mao when somebody comes out of the job, doesn't focus on it, and just stabs you in the back. It's doing a Mao. And it happens to quite a lot of people. Um, there are some people who specialize in meetings in simply waiting for the moment to pounce with a line like, hey, you sure that's realistic? You sure that fits in with our values? Now, those people just cheat. Um, they just say that in at the end. And you have to figure out who the Maos are and try and get rid of them. Because Maos, the one thing we know about them is they get promoted. They get promoted because they're focused on power, only power, and not getting on with the job. If they were getting on with the job, they wouldn't have so much time to be promoted. Now, that is not the same as saying that everybody who is in power is there for a Mao. But it would suggest, perhaps, it's a, just a an explanatory theory that some of them are, and they're very dangerous. Steve Jobs got quite good at it, uh, but he's not completely a Mao, but he got good at some of this close politics. Um, and it, we'll, we'll, we'll just skip for a second and come on to total institutions. All the people previously mentioned, including Hitler, who was there with his sin of uh, pr pride that was his uh, undoing, all to a uh, greater or lesser extent uh, built total institutions, even total societies. And they all ran out of steam. They all decayed. It wasn't because uh, sharing stuff and not being capitalist is necessarily a problem. It is because those kind of societies allow somebody who's doing a Mao to mouth the words, gain power, and then abuse the system. That's the problem. They all came up with various kinds of total institutions. I just want to look at a second the, the problem with that and why you would want to avoid any tendency towards uh, totalitarianism in an organization. Um, th this comes to some extent from work done by Goffman, who looked at the idea that extreme organizations expose the normal. Whatever's done in a camp during the Holocaust is therefore some reflection on what humans are like, and we can learn something about the everyday from looking at the extreme example. If I wasn't talking about death and ge genocide, um, it would be easier to accept. We know that the extreme reveals something about the everyday. It comes from ideas from, uh, the, in this case, Foucault, uh, and his idea of the gaze. You might have written it, which he has. Have you noticed? So one of his key concepts was the gaze, and it turns out he's kind of a, a low-rent hypnotist. <laughs> but, but also a public intellectual in France, and one of his ideas was following through concepts, and one of those concepts was the idea of uh, d discipline and punishment. And he looked at things like the prison, the, the idea that, that the prison where instead of punishing people as such, we put people in prisons and we, uh, we watch them every second of every day, he argued, and that we use the gaze upon people. The gaze is what is used to make people comply without beating them. Now, obviously, prisons do both. I've watched TV. And uh, the prison break had lots of that kind of stuff. But um, he was just saying the gaze. This is when you kind of feel the weight of the institution watching you, even though there's no evidence that it is, and therefore you comply. And you're not really sure why you're complying, but there's some vague thought that you'll maybe get sacked or embarrassed or uh, left out here. You seek, therefore, permission to improve, permission to do something different. Um, but have you ever tried something so different that it was a risk to see what happens? Mouse-style behavior suggests that people who are bad do it all the time. And I wonder what happens when people good do it. Would they get ahead as well? So the idea of the gaze. And then um, Bauman, uh, sorry, uh, we'll just move on. Oh, I've got two. He was very good. Um, 
So, so some suggestions, uh, some um, examples. There was the Magdalene laundries. Uh, assuming not everyone's heard of them, this was in Ireland. Um, the idea, well, it, it, it summarised there was that uh, this happened uh, in Ireland. It was the Catholic Church. There were laundries essentially run by nuns. And what would happen when there was some girl who got pregnant or was just a little maybe ever going to get pregnant out of wedlock, they'd lock them up and make them work in the laundries and they'd keep them there. They'd change their names instantly because that's important uh, in a total institution to take away your sense of who you are. So they'd put them in the laundry and then they'd um, just leave them there basically doing the laundry for decades. And eventually they'd pretty much forget who they were in the first place. So it's the Magdalene Laundry. So, you know, look it up. It's interesting. And as a result of locking them up from the outside, they stop having a realistic view of what is important and what isn't. When you're always at work and always talking to other people for whom the gaze is a, a problem, it's changing their behavior, it means that bit by bit you lose really contact with what's real and what isn't real, what's possible and what isn't possible. So by the time you've been here, when you first join a company, you've got optimism, but at the same time you don't know your way around. The risk is by the time you're here three years, you know your way around and you're really scared of what to do wrong. So you learn, you know, dogs learn. Uh, if they're slapped, and so do, do humans. So, so they lost a sense of their identity. The stolen generation refers to um, the Aborigine children in, uh, obviously, Australia. It's, it's the only one that titles it that way officially. The Aborigine children who were taken away from their parents and adopted by uh, non-Aborigine families as a deliberate way of trying to get rid of Aborigines. Uh, you'll have seen the, the fence story. Yeah? Uh, and so, yeah, and... Um, here, don't have time to go through all the detail, but it was a very deliberate way of saying, we shall get rid of your culture. We want to get rid of it. So um, at the same time that white children, um, there was lots of uh, th theoretical and uh, empirical work being done about the importance of the mother-child relationship and how to keep it. Uh, for Aborigine children, it was quite all right for medical reasons or for educational reasons. The same th thing happened with Native Americans here. It was quite all right to whisk them off to white homes because then they'd be saved. Thank goodness for white homes because then they can save these children. So this was also to total institution of a kind because the, the point was to erase the difference between them. We don't like the fact that they're different and therefore we will get rid of the difference and then the world will be a better place. It certainly had an impact. Um, not, not necessarily the, the intended one, but, but perhaps actually it was because there are fewer Aborigines as a result and there's less of an Aborigine culture as a result. It's just a particularly negative uh, result for the country. German Democratic Republic, um, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know whether this was a real word, but uh, Microsoft spell checks thought it was, <laughs> and so I was confident. Um, in walling a total society, obviously literally a wall between society, but how do you keep the people in? Because when they built the wall originally, people used to cross it regularly. Um, so they had to dream up the Stasi, and at one stage, one in three um, people in the uh, GDR were reporting on their neighbors. One in three people were talking about their neighbors. I think it's higher in the average corporate organization. Uh, if you think about how many people have off the you know, side conversations about what their colleagues are doing and find it hard to be totally supportive because it's certainly easier to say maybe something slightly unsupportive or at least not gung-ho uh, on their side because you never know whether the person you're talking to, including your boss, has already decided that your friend is a loser, uh, in which case it would be foolhardy to, to go with them. Obviously, that's a negative view of the world, but it, it's possible. So they had people reporting on people and they would do anything to, to keep their total society going. But again, it breaks down. It doesn't last forever. You just hurt a lot of people on the way. Camp X-ray. Um, seems fairly obvious that, uh, well, <laughs> that's terribly unscientific of me, but what is? Um, that, that there was some form of sen the sense that uh, American identity was being attacked. Therefore, let's get rid of other people's identities. I don't mean your identities necessarily, but there are a heap load of people who felt attacked that America was being destroyed um, and therefore were willing to accept the erasure of other people's identities. So, um, yeah, that's the way the Camper X-ray was at first. 
I mean, what justifies it? I'm not necessarily making here, I'm happy to make a political point in case anyone's interested, but I'm not trying to make a particular political point except that this is also a total institution. You know, but by the time this has happened to you, by the time you've been numbered and your beard's been sh you know, shaven off and then grown again, surely some of your identity has been removed. To what purpose? Uh, none. And in all of these cases, and I think it, it would be hard to find a counter factual to this, total institutions run down, run out of energy, and also cause uh, both intended and unintended horrors. So whenever we edge towards this in any form of organization, even a, a casual, happy corporate organization, we should be worried. Okay. Stuart Clegg, a um, cool guy to, to, in critical management, said, felt that there were 20 ways to construct total institutional power relations. And he listed them. Now, obviously, you can't read that fast. And, and even if you could, we couldn't discuss it. But when he listed them all, he said that um, things like um, uh, using expert knowledge to render power efficiently. This is when you bring in an expert in order to prove that you are right. So uh, imbalancing the conversation. If there's an expert saying it, then it must be true. Well, that's done all the time. I mean, they do it with me. Uh, somebody will bring me in to, and you have to figure out what the argument is and how you're being used as a pawn. Um, stripping members of markers of individual identity. A danger with induction, generally. Uh, the danger that you become bit by bit just like everybody else instead of being able to do things your own way. So I won't go through them all now. But um, I was interested in not how institutions keep their power, but uh, how institutions lose their power their negative power. That's much more interesting to an activist, um, of someone who wants to, at the corporate level, um, uh, lead to innovation and creativity and fulfillment at work. I mean, why not? We're at work all the time. We might as well be happy, seems to me. It's an optimistic, idealistic uh, sort of piece of nonsense, but still. Uh, so you could list uh, ways in which, organ this is just grouping, ways in which organizations overcome humanity. Yeah? Now, obviously, organizations are part of humanity, but they strip some of the best bits out. One of them is to maintain distance between people generally, but particularly between power groups. If you can main, maintain distance, then you're going to somehow be able to strengthen the, the mystique of the organization. Fetishize technique. Say that this is just the way we do things around here. So um, performance objectives, they've been fetishized in lots of organizations, for sure. Uh, it just is the way, and we don't touch them. Technique is left alone. Um, in, the, uh, in the Holocaust, uh, technique was similarly fetishized, and it was also cut up into bits, so nobody could really see the end from the, 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 sort of the beginning from the end, which meant that one person was doing a piece of uh, work, for instance, working on uh, railroad lines that were heading to Auschwitz, but wasn't part of the killing. But they were still necessary. So by cutting them off from the end to the beginning, you allow them to take part in the bad things without having to think about whether it's bad or not. Yeah? You can always, mumbo jumbo is a different way of uh, talking about fetishized technique, by the way. This is the way it has to be done. It's the way it's always been done. And how many, I mean, I'm involved in so many different grassroots things, and all the time people are being hit by, well, it's just the way it is. And, of course, we accommodate them by starting to use their language. It's the way we have to work, but it's not very good. Um, and encouraging obedience to power by making an organization a ceaseless round of activity with little room for reflection, where activity is mostly just a small link in a great chain of doing. So if you go back to those circles I had in there, the small organization to the large organization, you can get that idea of this as we spend less time considering whether what we all do is right, openly and actively with some ability to make a change, but it's just a ceaseless round of activity, then we don't have cause to reflect. Now, I'm not saying that this organization or GE or Toyota or whoever is truly a total organization. I'm just uh, asking people and reflecting myself on how close they come to this description and whether we might not want to go the other way, which is humanity overcoming organization. So you want to reduce distance between people, make people completely accessible. I mean, if it, th these grades get in the way in this company, for sure. They're five late grades above me. I mean, how can I disagree with him? 
um, de-fetishizing technique. Just talking about things in simple language, for instance, saying what a thing is. Being able to use a different term for the same thing without being corrected. Yeah? Um, encouraging, then, uh, overcoming complex di divisions of labor by reconnecting people in new and different ways. And that's why the mashup days that are being done are such a great thing, because at least they're connecting people. But it uh, hasn't uh, escaped our notice that they're only Redmond-based so far. So, of course, distance to the world is maintained. They're separate. Still, how would you overcome that? And how do you encourage disobedience to power by preventing organization work being a ceaseless round of activity and increasing room for reflection where activity is mostly just a small link. So how do you uncouple that chain? How do you get people to just stop and say, well, I'm not sure if that really works or have enough time to think about it? Now, obviously, the people that come to my lectures are thinking about it, kind of. Yeah, I mean, that's accepted. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So I would attract dissidents. So, um, <laughs> So they should t obviously film you <laughs> and to, you know, kick you out or something. The, um, so, so, so that's different, but, but how do we encourage other people to do it? And I'm just I'm in trying to introduce a different form of language in order maybe to do some of these things. It's not just about innovation done in a robotic way. Uh, you, you can get copies of these if you want. I'm in a sharing mood currently. Uh, Go. I was curious about the last term there, where, or phrase, where activity is mostly just a small link and a great chain of doing. Those are powerful words, but I'm not exactly sure what you mean by them in the context. Okay. If, um, I suppose it's the, big, the beginning and at the end I was talking about before, but, but uh, I'll um, expand upon it in that if you don't know, first of all, these descriptions were from total institutions, yeah? where, you, where the people working in them uh, give a good example. Well, torture has come to mind. Um, at least 30% of nations on Earth, I seem to believe it's 60%, but I don't want to exaggerate <laughs> in front of the group, at least 30% have torture and it's legal. And they have to have, therefore, torturers. And their torturers are motivated and organized, structured and paid, just like you, effectively. And um, they have away days and uh, all of those things in order to keep them good and motivated to keep that torturing going. Um, so it's organized in just the same way, but there are people who are, the people who are torturing are not only recruited in just the same way as you were uh, by a set of filters and aptitudes, but they're also somehow uh, stopped from asking whether this is such a good idea. They're taught by, the, what, uh, uh, let me give you more of a detailed example. In one uh, country, what they have is um, a new torturer recruit will, talk to, will be budded up with an old torturer recruit, and he won't be allowed to torture straight away. He has to observe because he wants to do it right. And so I'll get to the full answer, but um, he has to, to just observe. And then later on, he gets to slap a bit, and uh, just slap and then recover, and uh, learn to not reflect on whether this, again, is such a good idea. So if you do something that's just slight... Now, I'd be happy to slap any one of you uh, for, for, for money or not, really. Um, the, the, um, so if you just slap somebody, there's not much to feel bad about, really, especially if you've just been told that your nation that is patriotic, it's your patriotic sort of duty to slap people. So you get used to that, and you stop thinking about it. You're just doing it as a small link in a great chain of doing. And this is an extreme example. You're no longer thinking about it. You're just doing it. Then they're taught to do more and more and more. Other people who work it until they obviously do whatever you can imagine. And Casino Royale has a suitable example of slapping in that chair. Um, so you haven't seen it? You've obviously missed something. He's both naked and tortured. <laughs> that, that, that must please almost every subsection of you know, American society. Um, so, and British being tortured. There we go. That's the rest. Um, so the, there's the idea that, one, they're being, they're being tutored until they think no more. And they're not being asked to say, is this a good thing to slap people or a bad thing to slap people? I don't know. And that's, I assume, what they go home and say. They're not asked for reflection because anybody who starts reflecting it would say, well, either I'm a crazy psychopath um, or I'm doing the wrong thing. Now, you could expand that and say, what about armies? You could also expand it in a different way and say, well, what about the people who are janitors in torture establishments? 
do they think about what they're doing or are they just part of a chain of doing in which they say it's not my responsibility, I just do this, I only get the tea. How long does it take somebody, when I'm on the phone to a call centre, it takes me about five minutes to get somebody to disavow any link to the organisation at all. And they will just say, it's not me, it's not my rules, it's just the way it is. And I can even get them to say sorry about the way it is. Uh, and completely disavow five minutes. Because I disengage them from the chain, the, the great chain of doing, and make them think. And then they go, oh no, we make mis you know, people's lives hell. Sorry. Whereas most of the time, they're just going, I'm just part of a chain of doing. I'm just doing my job. I'm just doing my job. I'm just doing my job. I mean, endless, isn't it? Uh, I mean, the times that this has happened to me, uh, I don't even want to share. So I suppose what I'm saying is that if you're just passing on a task and you have no right and no expectation and no um, uh, permission to think as well as pass on because I'm just a chain and a great chain of doing, then you stop thinking. And that seems to, you have to decide yourselves to what extent that describes organizations you know of, where nobody knows why anybody did anything anymore. Yeah? Uh, I mean, the same for Thanksgiving plans. <laughs> um, so, some principles. I, I do want to come back to these things, but uh, I'll just uh, flip through. Is that okay as an answer? It's all right? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. I should have, like, little scorecards for how well I do. The, um, but, but come back to it. So, so, no, so I'm saying that if you, in, if you um, create opposites of this, if you reverse the ways in which organization overcomes humanity, then you might push the other way. So you would want to resist, if you're interested in achieving this, resist any efforts to increase distance. You want to reduce distance between you and other people and so on so that you can just be normal people with each other. I mean, the amount of secrets and things we do do when we're private. I'm not talking about everything you do in private, but I'm just talking about it generally. You want to reverse it. Um, these are just some principles that came from, please don't buy my book, but um, they came from the, the, the book Unshrink, and they were principles and myths. There's the idea in organization generally, you have to have an enemy. I don't even have to mention a program that has an enemy name attached to it. I sometimes wonder why that's necessary. Now, in a way, that's kind of shooting myself in the foot, I suppose, because now they'll never be invited to join. <laughs> but why do you have to have an enemy automatically? Well, because it stops you thinking about what it is you're doing, because you've got an enemy. And most governments and anybody else who wants to have control over you will invent some enemy, including sometimes your friends or your family who will decide that that family is an enemy or that person is an enemy or your in-laws are an enemy. Yeah? There's nothing that brings you closer than someone you mutually loathe. Um, but in the end, of course, there's only us. I mean, we are alienated from each other. We never really feel comfortable, with, completely comfortable with another human being, including, sadly, the people we love the most. Not completely, because you have to guard what you say in case the real you comes out and it's revealed what you think of them. Did you think I was re really being mean? Were you angry with me? No, of course I wasn't <laughs> angry with you. Do you think I was stupid? No, 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 no. I mean, I'd be a fool, wouldn't I? I'd say, yeah, you idiot, um, to a clear, dear, near and dear. But the more you can be honest both ways, then obviously the more also then you can admit that everybody is us. It's all connected, going right the way back to causal complexity. Stuff we do affects everything. It always has an impact on somebody. So somebody does talk to one person. It, I'm not talking even about karma, I'm talk, although it would be a nice idea if it happened that way. Um, but I'm talking about there is only us. No need for an enemy. Let's just get on with doing our thing. Which also goes back to the idea of making competition irrelevant. Make competition irrelevant by getting on with your thing. Costco have um, There's a great quote I should have put up here from the Costco founder um, where he says, um, he says, we just decide to do it our way, and we, make it, we decide to do... Things. I'm trying to do it without quite the language he used <laughs> in Fortune. But he sort of said, bleep. We, we want people to just leave us the bleep in heck alone. And we do things that are so crazy that nobody would want to copy us. So we reduce margins so much that the greedy people over at Walmart would never copy us because it's not in their nature to reduce margins. But we reduce margins. Uh, and if you've checked Costco out, you'll know that they make way more money than Sam's Club. And they make way more money because they do things in this perverse way. 
they don't trip over all the time to Sam's Club to copy them. It's the other way around. I mean, you walk into Sam's Club at first and you think you are in a Costco. But then you talk to somebody and then you realize you're not. You're in a place that is some form of total institution that doesn't like people very much. But, you know, that's just a, an idea. Copying is not very good for the soul in this sense. Um, the idea that the plan must be secret always seemed a bad idea for me, but still common currency in organizations. Just, just, you just leave that with me. I'll, I'll find out what they think about it. People keep their sources, their contacts, their information, their plans, their ideas secret. And um, for no good reason, uh, apart from their own Mao-like sort of power and fear. Only the goal ever unifies, so you might as well share everything. So if you ever find yourself saying, oh, we better keep that secret, unless it's keeping it secret from a Mao, keep those plans secret, you should share it. Just give it all away. Toyota that we mentioned earlier again, regularly used to take GM and Ford over to its Japanese plants to show them its quality engineering on the basis that it knew that they would go back and do what? Copy it. And they already knew that they were going to make 80,000 changes before they even implemented. <laughs> so a Microsoft example would be Google put answers up. This is also controversial, but Google have Google answers. Microsoft take 18 months figuring out a, a reply. By that time, they've taken Google answers out. They've killed it. So Google, in the time it takes Microsoft to come up with a competitor, have exited. Now, that's only an example, and you don't have to agree with that, but there are lots of such examples. If you keep things secret, it just doesn't help. You might as well tell the opposition what you're doing, because culturally, they'll never be able to do it exactly the way you do anyway. The boss is superhuman. Uh, Blair, I like to diss him lots, um, not because as a human being, obviously, he's one of me. I don't want to create a false enemy, but there is this idea that the boss is superhuman. They pretend and are trapped by it. We pretend and are trapped by it. The cult of the hero CEO. We're just all human. That's a good thing and a bad thing. That means we all trip up, etc. But these are principles, I think, that keep some of the totalitarian stuff um, going. There was a cult of Mao. There was a cult of Stalin. Um, it regularly, women, it, 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 Mao used to have a swimming pool full of women who would come to him who believed that he was supreme and uh, deific. He'd do all of those things. Um, surely they should have woke up and gone, he's just a, like a fat, balding man. There's nothing wrong with fat or balding necessarily, but he was just a man. Uh, so you keep this in mind. And also that an organizations are not machines. If you run them as machines, you're doing it wrong. You're just uh, doing it wrong. Organizations are communities. And they operate best as communities. They can operate the other way. You can run anything wrong. You can put diesel into a, a non-diesel car. You can run anything wrong, but it tends to reduce the life span of that particular machine. And the same is certainly true, true in this case. When you discover it, you put an animal in a small cage, it goes berserk, doesn't it? I mean, it loses all will to live. So now we have bigger cages for them in the, nearby, in the zoo. Um, but at least we're expanding the cage bit by bit. Um, organizations have to be treated as communities. Very different. Okay. In these organizations, then you want to create slack. Now, this is, again, a bottom line thing, I suppose, but real slack. That slack to just kind of say what you want and do what you want and then know when to get on with work. But it can't be cheated in. Let me show you it. And then there is a difference between useful slack and busy waste. Some people are always busy, and they're a complete waste of space. Um, obviously not, again, in large terms. They're my brothers. Um, but, but in corporate terms... Rather than useful slack, people who come up with cool stuff all the time, useful stuff. But uh, there's a, a great story from um, Semco, the, the one owned by, um, oh, I just forgot, uh, Ricardo Semler, uh, the Maverick stuff. But the story I like is the one where he takes over the company. It's ailing. It's his father's company. I mean, he is privileged. He, hires all, he fires all his secretaries. Well, actually, he relocates them. He says, I don't need secretaries, and I don't need um, all of this paraphernalia. I'll just be with everybody and figure it out. He gave his company the, um, the right to move his office whenever they wanted. I mean, these are quite big things. It was the opposite of the total organization. I'm sure a lot of it's hype, but there are certainly some truths. And they found one guy, a salesman, who was really lazy, at least it appeared so. He um, used to just sit on a chair with his feet up on the desk and read manuals, technical manuals. He's kind of obsessed with them. And they used to build um, parts for oil wells, and he'd just read these manuals. 
um, a real nerd in that respect. And obviously, we think here that's a good thing. <laughs> so, so it's a compliment. And uh, he'd read them. Well, in a typical organization, you would fire him because he never sold anything. But in this organization, what they realized by observation was that whenever there was an emergency, a fire or a breakdown in an oil well, and that's probably a quite a costly thing, they, this guy knew the answer automatically, despite not being a technician. They'd say, well, what's the, and they'd get him on the phone. So usually he'd only be called into action once every six months or so, but it was worth paying him just for that one day. And that's a different way of looking at people, figuring out what they do properly rather than keeping them busy. I hate watching the clock in order to justify my value. What a terrible thing that is. Um, so I'll just show you a bit of video that hopefully will work and then plow on to the end. How many converters we have inside? We don't know where our trucks are. No one knows where Mackler is. Six thousand converters. Trucks are at I four exit nine. Mackler, where are you? In the airport. Okay. So, so the point. Of, well, you know the point of that already, but. It just it makes me just wonder why, why can't you do that in a meeting? Why would that be frowned upon? I actually, as you, I was taken to the Microsoft Museum on one occasion. The first time I came to Microsoft, it was a tour, and that's all I saw. And I was really looking forward to you know I've been to the Museum of Flight. I was looking forward to something, and it's like a shop, isn't it, yeah. with some failures. So the things we've done wrong that we're pretending we've done right, and then the shop. Anyway. So I was a bit disappointed, but it turned out all right, and I was very grateful for the visit and everything. But the, the, my point was, when I went around, one of the most interesting things was um, seeing those pranks. There, there used to be, at least. I haven't been back since. Um, there used to be photos of the kind of uh, the jokes people, practical jokes people would play on each other. Are they still there? There's like the billiard, the, the, te the table tennis balls that are all stuffed into a cubicle, that kind of thing. And it, it did occur to me, uh, linked to this, I wonder if the, there, in a sense, they were, being, they were very happy and wanted to boast about how the essence of Microsoft was about having good fun and doing good work. And I wondered what then the prank ratio has become. Is the prank ratio now lower or higher? Can anybody remember the last time that a really crazy prank was played? Well, you know, it was me with that pie in the face in, the, in Belgium to, to Bill. That was the last one. Is that you? <laughs> no, it wasn't me. But it, <laughs> but it, but it kind of should have been. It would be it's such a neat thing. No, it wasn't me. But my point is that where, where is it? So that might be a ratio. We could do different kind of ratios to measure Microsoft on any particular week that seem relevant. If the prank ratio is going down, then that tells you something. People think that they'd be viewed at, you know, that's enough of a point. Yeah. So that we should be able to have good fun and just get on with our jobs. And I actually mean good fun, like crazy stuff. What difference does it make? It would certainly cheer things up. Uh, so uh, back to complex causality uh, as, we're, as we're rounding up. Um, in this case, I probably should just play it, this clip, but I won't. But uh, I would uh, suggest to you all, how many people have listened to the whole uh, I Have a Dream speech? you listened to it all? It's yeah, I've got everybody. In the UK, we just get it as part of adverts for Nike or something like that. You know, we just have the, the end bit. But there are loads of interesting things about this as a case study. So obviously, I'm looking at complex causality for getting things to improve in organizations. So you could, um, d depending on who you asked, people would say, uh, I don't have time for, for truly interactive, but you could say, oh, it was the speech. That's what did it. That's civil rights, the speech did it. But obviously, we all know that it wasn't the speech that did it. It was something else. So what? What led to, I'll only call them uh, semi-equal legal rights or something. You know, that's as far as I'll go. So what led to that in sort of the, the, the mid-60s, 63, 64, that was passed? What led to it? Was it the speech? No, it wasn't the speech. But it had an impact. Was it Rosa Parks sitting down? Was that what did it? Well, it had an impact. Why did she sit down? Well, it wasn't because she was tired. She said that herself. She did it deliberately. 
because she was married to somebody who was part of the civil rights movement, and uh, they knew that they were looking for a poster girl of civil disobedience, so she sat down on purpose. Was it the first time she'd sat down? No. She'd sat down on at least three other occasions, and on each of the other ones she'd got kicked off the bus um, earlier and just made to walk once in the rain, once not, at least three times. So it wasn't the first time. And she was, so it was, was it the husband joining the civil rights movement and uh, wooing Rosa that led to it? Obviously not. So it couldn't only be that. How about the fact that Martin Luther happened to have moved in as a new uh, reverend or, or whatever, new pastor, into the same town as Rosa Parks? That's some coincidence. It turns out that the person who can sit down with, unimpeachable, um, you know, with an unimpeachable background, Rosa, because she wasn't the first woman to sit down on a bus and get busted. Um, she was at least the second, and the first one, unfortunately, was going to be used as a poster girl. But uh, th then it turned out that she'd had some kind of affair with some, some older guy, and it was viewed that this would be negative. You know, what bad luck that is. You do the thing, nobody ever remembers. You know, that, that's another d discussion. But um, she, wasn't a, so she wasn't the first person. Um, he moves in, and exactly the person to kind of start the move, not start the movement, but really force the movement up from that location happens to move in with Rosa. Or is it something else? And I haven't got the time. You know, was it the people that it, it rebelled on the Amistad? Is that really what happened? Or is there just some natural way in which you think it was about 500 years before that the first slaves arrived, as far as I can remember. Um, was it that it takes 500 years and eventually they get freed? It runs out of steam. Because I know slavery ends before this point, but really it doesn't end until people are equal. It can't end until they're, they're equal. So is it that it just runs out of steam? It's just another total institution and it has a 500-year history. If so, that's very dispiriting because it suggests that inequality takes half a millennia before it even gets close to being sorted. And then we just find a new enemy and um, find somebody new to hate. So complex causality says lots and lots of things. And the reason for mentioning it, I missed a, a slide out, is that if you want to change stuff, you have to find out what trends are happening anyway, what's moving, and then you get involved. And you don't know exactly where it will end, except that usually the trend is to exit total institutions and bad things. So if you can just band together you just become one of these streams of causality, just one of them. So it's worthwhile. That should cheer you up. What shall I do? Join one of these chains. See what happens? OK. Uh, and in so doing, you become an idealist. And I don't mean just an idealist in terms of believing the world is a good place, but an idealist in form of a simplifier, somebody who simplifies. Um, physicists, anyone? Who's the physicist? There should be one here, uh, by the law of averages. But um, a physicist who simplifies things. If you want to figure out how big the sun is, you don't draw every little uh, flickery bit of flame and explosion. I mean, imagine how long that would take. You just draw a circle, and you assume that that's an approximation of what the sun is, and then you work it out mathematically. You simplify. Realists just point to too much detail. I said earlier that complexity is good to admit as a fact, but it's not good to work with. You have to simplify. What is it that's really happening here? How can we simplify what the organization does and what it pushes out and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or could be improved? Um, we've discussed this before, so sorry for people who want to miss it. Um, you need to ask big questions. Why, why, why not? I love showing the, these kind of things and showing them to myself because as soon as I see a remote control car that's shorter than an ant, I think something more is possible. So someone who says it's been tried before, the idea factor has been tried before, MS Labs has been tried before, how could we possibly have mass grassroots innovation at Microsoft? It's impossible. It's been tried before. You kind of suggest it can't be impossible, can it? Um, people build that thing. Or that. Someone quits NASA to build that in his um, garage. It's just a fabulous story. You know the story, obviously. Um, you think like a physicist because you think round a different way. Um, Seen this? The, this is a physics exam in Denmark. A question on it says, describe, describe how to determine the height of a skyscraper with a barometer. The guy answers, you tie a long piece of string to the neck of the barometer and you dangle it down. The length of the string plus the length of the barometer <laughs> will equal the height of the building. Yeah, different way of thinking. Now that's funny anyway. Um, uh, and he fails his exam. His professor is you know, livid, it's an undergraduate physics. 
uh, livid, says she fails. They, they talk about it, the, the kid says, look, it didn't mention physics in the question, so you can't fail me, I deserve another go. So he has another go. He gets 20 minutes to answer the question. After 15 minutes, they say, aren't you going to write anything down? And he says, uh, don't you know the answer? And he says, of course I know the answer. He said, I know at least 20 answers to this question. And they say, so write them down. And he writes 20 of them down you know, quickly. But uh, the 20th is this, which is undoubtedly the best way would be to knock on the door of the janitor and say, if you'd like a new barometer, I will give you this one if you tell me the height of the skyscraper. And this again is yet again useful when you learn that he wasn't just smart, as a smart Alec. He was smart. So it turns out that he's the first Dane to win the Nobel Prize for Physics. That's fabulous. That means that he was as smart as he thought he was. You know? Uh, and he used this kind of what, what you know, maybe we termed an imaginative leap, an imaginative experiment, to at least, um, I, I can't say solve, because nothing's ever solved for sure, but certainly to contribute to an understanding of how molecules and atoms really move. And he suddenly is hit by an insight, which is purely theoretical, not at all empirical, hit by the insight that, um, uh, that you'll probably know better than I, that, but that an electron simply moves, simply moves from one place to another place without moving in between. Well, he didn't prove it, he just thought it. And he had this sudden breakthrough and said, oh, that's a great idea. And it was on the eve of his honeymoon, and he cancelled his honeymoon as a result. <laughs> and wrote the paper, which was a complete imaginative leap, and that's what he won the Nobel Prize for Physics for, eventually. So I'm just, you know, this is a different way of thinking, this slack way of thinking. That's where you get the breakthroughs. So if we're looking for this Microsoft Corporation organization for breakthroughs, you wouldn't want to stop people really being daft and having, you know, thumb wars or something. And I should start a thumb war league at Microsoft, and it would probably promote more innovation than all of the other programs put together. <laughs> Cut my, my McKinsey and I'll just do it for free. No problem. Um, so we don't want sheep in organizations. But you can't herd cats. Sorry, you've got to miss that. I know there'll be a cat lover. I, that's not put up there as a specter for you to compete with. But the Google time things spread already since I was here last talking about it to Genentech and to Apple. And you don't have like a little bit of time. Um, there's the idea of fiascos, that, that slack for fiascos. This is a kettle um, designed by Philip Stark. It doesn't look like a kettle, and it doesn't look like it works. And it doesn't work. And um, it was designed by Philip Stark, a French guy, who designs a bunch of stuff that doesn't work, by the way. I have bought quite a bit of it, being a, <laughs> being a design junkie. No, not a good idea. Good for the moment you give the gift, but not after that. But um, by a company called the Lacey, two brothers, Italian, um, who boast about fiascos. One brother's a lot more daring than the other. He's always going, I don't know, whatever their, their names are, but Alberto, you, we're always wasting money with these kettles. So it's something like that. That'll offend everybody too. Um, but he's saying that, and he says, no, 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 th this is wrong. We have to have fiascos. And the reason we have to have fiascos is we are a design company, therefore on the cutting edge. And if you're on the cutting edge, you have to veer over it, or you don't know where the edge is. And that means you have to have public failures or fiascos better. And what he's done is started not just a Microsoft museum of Ted-like failures and Bob-like failures, but um, a coffee book which has fiascos in it. And they boast about it. They say, well, you know, beautiful coffee book full of fiascos. And they've also, so not only do they make everybody know it's okay to have a fiasco, this sells and their, their, their people are happy. And they've also changed their production line mechanism so that they can produce maybe a thousand of these things and if they sold half of them they'd still break even which is fairly remarkable for something like this so the idea of saying if we're going to have more fiascos in order to get to the cutting edge to find the new growth thing then we'd want to rejig the whole way the organization works in order to make that not a kill not a death I mean if you produce one of these and you die as a company that's a bad thing so you don't start maybe with your main operating system but you do have a fiasco well you've tried that haven't you for a few years <laughs> It should maybe be in a... And so um, the, then you look for, for swap... Well, well, we'll cover that. So there's different kind of leaders, and they sometimes have um, what would be viewed as weaknesses. Um, I'm not a, a total big fan. I mean, he was a, a warmonger who happened to find a war, which was good for us Brits. Um, but he was very contrary. He disagreed with everybody else, and it proved to be quite useful because if you have people who disagree with everything, Sooner or later, one of the people who disagree is right. 
And that's what he did. You have uh, Gorbachev, who does something different. He goes with sacrifice. He actually sacrificed his political career for some kind of progress. That's unusual. You could choose that road to, to making a difference. Or, or Gandhi will skip, because you know that. Or Mandela himself, who's just ultra stubborn. I mean, how long can you stay in one jail for? So stubbornness appears to be a really good thing. Stubbornness to a point, and then agreement. And you usually need two extremes, and you have to choose kind of, do I want to be that extreme, or the other extreme, or the moderate in between? Which part do I play and change? You need a Malcolm X for every Luther King. You need one. Well, you actually need quite a few, because you've got to scare the extremist on the other side into cooperating. You find a war that hasn't been um, eventually agreed by moderates in the middle of two extremists. Um, I think that's uh, uh, pretty much enough, it, it, because somebody will leave next. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, skip, no, we'll just skip to, to the end. Oh, no, look, I can do it for you. Peer to power, this is another push, how to get a bigger brain, both to reconnect to other people, um, to steal and share ideas freely. What would it take? It would take quite a lot, I think, for people to really steal and share ideas without saying, no, it's mine. I've had loads of ideas I've given from here, and they've been stolen. Nobody's ever been back to say thank you. But um, I do it anyway, because they're, you know, they're, they're plenteous. But you have to consider what kind of environment do you need in which ideas could be shared while everybody benefited. Um, how to reconnect people. Uh, still, a bit more of your social networking could do with being applied to your own organization. I suggest you have some of the very best tools in the world for doing this. And you consider how to connect yourself and outside. Why is it that I can't get inside Microsoft's IT systems after all this time? Why are you locking us out you know, of your world groove to so solve some of that? How to connect? And how to bring in customers into this whole deal, which is obvious. Uh, a total institution locks people out. It says, this is who we've got. This is who we control. Something that's the reverse of that says, no, everybody. We'll bring in everybody. We'll have customers designing. This is a share your idea. Um, uh, run in this case, and what they did was it was Club Nokia, and they had, we don't even have this fully maybe for employees, but this was for customers, and you could submit your idea, win stuff, have your stuff patented and protected, and um, the, oh, there we go, and th these were the winners. Uh, this person from Turkey won the Nokia competition, he came up with a bracelet that was a mobile phone um, that they're now starting to build. Uh, this is a customer who comes up with this um, and these ideas. So, and this is just part of bringing humanity back into the organization, completely back in so people can be themselves. And by doing all of this, by overcoming organizational, the bad organizational tendencies, you deliver to people what they really want, which is freedom and purpose, you know, making a difference, which seems pretty useful for life. You know, life is short, you die alone, all of that stuff in pain. Um, so you would want to have as much fun in between as you can. So if I, I'm not trying to deliver it as some kind of motivational speech, but it seems quite important. And on the other hand, all the innovations come from people who are having a good time making a difference. So if you're interested in the bottom line, this makes sense at the same time, which is a, a kind of neat, optimistic place to leave it. Uh, thank you very much for your time.